There he is, clambering between the crags, a fresh specimen strapped to his back, while a golden eagle clutching its prey soars in the foreground. Audubon projected the image of himself as a frontiersman, a Daniel Boone of ornithology. He had no formal art training and no scientific background, but he did have an insatiable passion for knowledge and description. He travelled all over America so that he could paint his targets in their natural settings. He would shoot them and wire their corpses in place to make them look natural. Audubon was a brilliant stylist with a strong sense of profile and a whiplash line. And the results go far beyond the category of ornithological prints. Following the taste of his day, he would sometimes present his birds in moralizing human terms. Of these two pairs of Carolina turtle doves, he wrote, On the branch above, a love scene is just commencing. The female seems doubtful of the truth of her lover and virgin-like resolves to put his sincerity to the test by delaying the gratification of his wishes. A very American bird. Like Cole, Audubon saw how American progress threatened the continent. Some of his prints are elegies for species that were already facing extinction. And he was right to worry. The star of empire, as some Americans called it, was rising and the movement was west. On the 2nd of March, 1846, the following words were declaimed to the US Senate. The untransacted destiny of the American people is to subdue the continent, to rush over this vast field to the Pacific Ocean, to teach old nations a new civilization. Divine task, immortal mission, let us tread fast and joyfully the open trail before us. The phrase that summed all this up and rang in the ears of American whites was manifest destiny. It meant what it said, that it was manifest, obvious beyond all argument, that empire had to expand beyond the Mississippi and not stop rolling until it met the Pacific. Whatever you found on the way was yours by absolute right. And if the Indians fought back, they weren't just resisting invaders, they were up against history itself. And to see yourself as a force of history is to be absolved from both pity and from guilt. Manifest Destiny was America's great myth of redemptive violence, and art played a considerable role in promoting it. John Gast's picture, American Progress, shows a goddess with the star of empire stuck to her forehead, proceeding like a blonde blimp above the ranks of the advancing settlers while the Indians fall back. She unreels telegraph wire as she goes. In high art, the message was less blatant, but not very much. Albert Bierstadt paints the Conestoga wagons rolling forward into the westering sun, which floods them in golden light, implying, as one orator put it, that progress is God. Cheap coloured prints were produced in their tens of thousands by the lithographers Currier and Ives, enticing a near mass audience with promises of fortune in the West, where the settler would arrive in an American Eden, filling his log cabin with abundant game and family values. The hero of Manifest Destiny was Daniel Boone, the frontier scout, Indian killer, and real estate dealer who found a way from Virginia across the mountains into Kentucky and thus westwards. Here, the artist George Caleb Bingham fuses him with the biblical image of Moses, leading his people towards a land of milk and honey. 
The Daniel Boone legend sets the terms of the mythology that would, for Americans, describe and explain the, proce the process of, uh, of westward expansion for the next century. Uh, the process always involves a kind of exile from civilization, a kind of regression to the world of the savage. But from that regression comes a kind of purification, a new contact with nature, a regeneration of the spirit, a regeneration of earthly fortunes as well. And ultimately, the man who has gone to the wilderness becomes the agent for a further advance of civilization against the wilderness. In 1861, the United States government decided to make the imagery of Manifest Destiny official by commissioning a huge 600 square foot mural for it on one of the main staircases of the Capitol in Washington. The artist chosen was Emanuel Leutzer, who had already become famous for painting Washington crossing the Delaware. And if there was any artist in America who could be relied upon to produce a large, efficient, patriotic engine, as it were, that man was Leutzer. The metaphor is Exodus, with that Daniel Boone-like frontier scout once again as Moses displaying the promised land of California to the chosen people toiling up the crest of the Rockies. A young man rises in his stirrups to catch sight of the distant land. Broken wagon wheels and animal skulls suggest the death toll of earlier migration. But there is no one left to oppose them now. The plains below are empty of Indians. But the victims of Manifest Destiny never ceased to haunt the art of American whites. In the Black Hills of South Dakota, work keeps going on the largest, though perhaps not the best, sculpture in the world. Begun in 1949, the blasting of a mountain into an effigy of the Lakota Indian chief, Crazy Horse. The whole thing will be 560 feet high. Crazy Horse's nose alone is 27 feet long. It's the invention of a Polish emigrant named Korzak Zielkowski, who meant it as a reply to the faces of the presidential dead white males on Mount Rushmore, 20 miles away. Korzak died in 1982, but his family continued blasting out the form of Crazy Horse. One of his five daughters, Monique, drove me to the top to show me the work on the head 45 years after her father started it. Did Korzak ever imagine that this could be finished in his lifetime? No, I don't think so. He thought he would carve something 100 feet high at first, but then when Henry Standing Bear and him picked out the mountain, he just thought, what the hell, I have no place to go, so I'll carve the whole mountain. Well, did he have all you offspring to carry it on then? Or? No, he didn't know that he was going to have a family until he married my mother. He called her Fertile Myrtle. Fertile Myrtle. <laughs> and she was. How many of you, how many there, of you are there? There are ten of us. And every of single of one of you is working on this? Seven of us still yeah. work. When finished, if it is finished, it will look something like this. An Art Deco paperweight the size of a small alp. Crazy Horse points in answer to the derisive question of a white man, where are your lands now? He answers, my lands are where my dead lie buried. This line was Korzak's starting point. My lands are where my dead lie buried. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful?
But European artists have been praising, deriding, or trying to be objective about the American Indian ever since they got here. The most energetic of them was the artist explorer George Catlin in the 1830s. Catlin was largely free from the prejudices that disfigured white American views of Indians. He didn't idealize them as noble savages. He didn't demonize them as brutes. He tried to see them as real people in a real, if exotic, social setting. Catlin also tries to deal with this problem of the ephemeral quality of the wilderness, uh, the fact that we destroy it as we appropriate it. We murder for the uh, sect. That's right. Um, uh, and the paintings are, uh, are, I suppose, his primary means for preserving at least the image of the, the, that world. However, Catlin also proposes the creation of a kind of Indian preserve uh, on what